Off the ball. This is News Talk. Now you're very welcome back. So we're going to turn to Formula One. The new season is still a while away yet. First race is mid-March. The future of Lewis Hamilton, the big talking point in some respects in the sport right now. And the fallout from Abu Dhabi is never ending, it seems. Very happy to welcome Jess McFadden to the show of Motorsport Net. Jess, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. So, I am sceptical here, by the way. I think there is absolutely no chance that we don't see Lewis Hamilton back trying to break the record. However, Zach Brown, McLaren boss, who's in contact, I'm sure, with Toto and chatting about things, he came out this week and said he really wouldn't be shocked if Hamilton decided to walk away from the sport. As such is his level of anger over what happened. Toto Wolves described him as very disillusioned at the moment. He's been conspicuous by his absence on social media. And I think the new F1 president reached out to him and Hamilton wasn't quite ready to respond. So I'm not saying there's nothing going on. I'm, I'm sure he's in a, still probably feeling uh, the effects of what happened. But uh, I don't know, I'd, I'd be utterly shocked. It would, have been, would be one of the most amazing stories and walkaways from a sport. Wouldn't it? And what an end to what has been an absolutely amazing career as well. Um, I think we're all we're all waiting to hear something. That the, the only statement that we've really heard that has any waiting is that he's considering the outcome of the FIA investigation into what happened into Abu Dhabi before he makes his call. But the FIA have decided to make that a little tricky by saying that they're actually not going to re- reveal the findings until that first Grand Prix weekend in Bahrain. So that kind of leaves him in a situation where he can't do what he says he wants to do in terms of wait and find out what the findings were. He kind of has to make a call because we've got testing in between mm. then and now. So, but I think what Zach's getting at is, you know, we, anything can happen. But the fact is, is that he could decide to walk away. And, and from where we're sat, um, uh, that we've been able to enjoy, you know, what's been a career since 2007, which is, is, is quite a, quite a stint in Formula One. Um, he has nothing to prove, you know, he's, he owes Formula One nothing at all. He's statistically the most uh, successful driver that we've ever seen. And obviously the only thing that was missing, the only piece of the puzzle is that eighth world title that would that would see him uh, take the record from Michael Schumacher. But everything else he's achieved, everything else he's done. So he owes it nothing. And I think that's the, the question mark around his return is is the fact that he's given so much to the sport. And it did feel at the end of last year like it, it was for nothing. It, it could get taken away whenever the FIA or Formula One decided that they wanted to. And I think that's, that's, that's the problem. But I think what Zach Brown also goes on to say is that there's no doubt that he loves racing. Lewis Hamilton is an out and out racer and he has been since he was about five years old. So mm. I think that that pull will pull him back. But I'm, I, you know, it's a bit, we love this in Formula One. We always get this kind of power play between drivers, teams, the governing bodies, Formula One. They all want to assert power and to uh, kind of have the, the the media circus follow their narrative. And I think that's what we've been seeing in this in this period of silence. There's often a lot that can be read into if nothing is said at all, because we all just start making our own stories and we all start reading into it almost more than if there had been a statement from Lewis. Um, so mm. it's been it's been a fascinating time uh, being working within the within the sport. And again, I don't think we've had anything like it. But don't forget that last year we were also waiting for him to even sign a contract, and nothing really that you know damaging to him had happened at that point. So he's he's you know he he likes to he likes to play it his way, and I think that's been earned. That right has been earned from the fact that he's Lewis Hamilton. He did ultimately sign a two-year deal with Mercedes last year, which would take him to the end of 23, in theory, for 40 million sterling a year. Thank you very much. There is something uh, wonderfully crafty about the FAIA saying, well, we're not going to publish the results of our official inquiry into what went on in Abu Dhabi until effectively when the new season has started. It's akin to Boris Johnson saying, we're going to publish Sugre's report after the next general election. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, and again, as is the FIA's right, they can decide how long they want to or feel that they need to give uh, for a report like this. I think all of us would say that we definitely want a thorough report, but whether or not it actually takes them that long to look into what effectively was three laps, it take, we don't know. It, it, should take them, um, it should take them a week. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the criticisms that we've thrown the FIA's way uh, is to do with stewarding and how long it takes them to come to decisions over whether an overtake was legit or not. Like, you know, we, they they do like to take their time. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it goes without saying that I think this is a bit of a power play from the FIA um, It because it, it, it means that Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton have to move first. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's, that happens all the time, not even just for something as, as, as kind of uh, as big and, and, and as, as visible as this, it, it happens all the time that they're, they're, they're all playing this power game. It's like a game of chess. It's amazing. I love, I personally love it. I mean, I would hate for us to get to testing or Bahrain and have a grid without Lewis Hamilton on it. Um, but that's the kind of the game we play. Yeah. Things would feel very incomplete if he suddenly, uh, walked off into the sunset. Mercedes have denied this, but I wanted to see what you're hearing. So Michael Massey, the race director, was very much front and centre, obviously, after Abu Dhabi in particular. The word was, or the reporting was, that Mercedes have dropped their appeal against the FAI final decision on the understanding that Michael Massey will no longer be in his position as race director next season. Mercedes have denied that. So, one, do we even know if Michael Massey is going to depart as race director? And if so, why? Where are we on this one? Officially, there's been no word. Um, and I don't think there will be until we get much closer to to testing. There's been a lot of people reading into uh, org charts. So the FIA every year um, reveal uh, the structure. So who's looking after what and who's responsible for what areas of the FIA. Um, and especially with the new president, um, that's been released. And, and Michael Massey's name is missing. But that's not to say that he's no longer going to be a part of the of F1 or the FIA. That just means that he didn't appear on that particular org chart, which was very top level, I might add. It wasn't ex an extensive org chart with absolutely everybody that works in the FIA. Uh, it just had the uh, the the kind of the top line people. Um, so you know, we're we're gonna look, we want answers, and I think especially to do with Michael Massey's future, that is definitely a key topic of interest. Now, we we know for a fact that teams like to make negotiations and deals when it comes to appeals. Um, and the speed at which Mercedes dropped the deal would suggest that something has been agreed. Okay. Something, something has been agreed. Whether or not that has anything to do with Michael Massey, we have no idea. Yeah. Um, but it's that you would you would imagine that something as big as that, as upset that clearly Mercedes were with what happened in Abu Dhabi, they will have had something on the negotiation table that would mean that they would drop that and leave it and allow it to stand um, that Max Verstappen is the world champion. Interesting. We don't need to relitigate the Abu Dhabi situation and uh, no. there, there, are, there are conflicting views, uh, but I'm just curious, in your opinion, did Massey make a bit of a mess of the last race? Yes. Um, but whether or not that was his call is, I mean, ultimately he's race director, he makes he makes the calls and that's obviously the the reasoning as to why they kicked out Mercedes appeals on the on the night was that uh, there's a piece of legislation in the regulations that basically says the race director has final say over how the safety car is is used. But had things gone differently and obviously we're, we're sitting with our hindsight hats on here, mm -hmm. um, it's not the call that I don't I don't think any anyone would have potentially made that same call but we weren't the race director at the time mm. um there's a, a, been a bunch of opinions come out in the aftermath I still stand with the fact that I don't think that it should happen I think this 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 series this sport motorsport in general is is quite a complicated um thing to be a part of or to watch and I think when even the people involved at the very very heart and center of the sport don't understand the regulations or there's gray areas um to do with the the you know what's what's the process or not the process then we're only going to hurt ourselves and i think that's that for me is why I, I feel like it wasn't correct it was it was very very much playing with the gray areas um and it's caused 
a huge amount of, of fallout. Right. So well, yeah, yeah sure I don't, has. I don't think, I don't think, yeah, if it was me, bro, maybe wouldn't have done it. But again, not in that situation. No idea what kind of pressures um, there were in in making that decision or not. So I think, uh, yeah, I think everybody's got their opinion on it. <laughs> One of the really entertaining aspects of Formula One is listening in on the likes of, not least on the occasion of Abu Dhabi, but listening in on the likes of Toto Wolf or Christian Horner of Red Bull, trying to bend the arm and persuade the race director to make a decision in a certain way. So it seems, uh, I mean, you can confirm or deny, maybe this is official, but it seems that into next season, we won't see that anymore. Team principals will not be allowed to get on the radio and talk to the race director. That is no more after what happened. I would be very surprised if that's still allowed to happen. I think especially because not only did it put the race director in a really difficult position and paint the FIA and the steering process in a in a appalling light, um, it also didn't shine very brightly on the team principals either. Um, it showed, you know, a really kind of strange side of 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 what goes on behind up until that point behind closed doors and i don't think anybody particularly liked it and which is a real shame because actually sorry i liked it i thought it was absolutely enthralling I, me too it was actually something i suggested to, to the fia um to do at one point okay. to do yeah uh, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna call credit and say that they did it because of me but sure. i did it was something that i said that in terms of uh having the audience understand better that process and and how that relationship works it would be great to be able to hear you know why a decision has been decided in that way um or you know the the thought processes or, or what goes on i think you know we want more clarity when it comes to that side of of how f1 works um but it backfired massively i mean i i sassy massy hotline was one of my highlights of last year um i absolutely thought it was brilliant but again if you're thinking from their perspective it it, it wasn't right and it shone actually that the, there should be rules made about how much um, team principals or you know team managers can lobby the race director and the fact that I think I, I would be very very surprised if we don't have something in the regulations for this year uh, in their amendments because there are always amendments we're always adding to the rule book of Formula One um, that that it will be a one-way communication okay. I don't believe that they will be able to pick up the phone or send an email um, as uh, Toto Wolf tried to do last year as well. Uh, I don't think they'll be allowed. Okay. So yeah, I very much, I very much, I, I hope, I would love for them to keep the radio on the broadcast. I'm not, I, I would be surprised if it, if it is. Interesting. Uh, back to matters of driving. Uh, Valeteri Bodas, if people even just watch Drive to Survive, cuts this uh, forlorn figure a lot of the time and, and it's tough in Lewis Hamilton's shadow. Let's just say for a second, Hamilton genuinely is prepared to walk away from 40 million a year and the chance to beat Schumacher's record. Is Bodas lead quality driver or would uh, Mercedes be very much in the market for some kind of marquee name? They would, they would be in a very difficult position. It is kind of, it would be a, almost a repeat of 2016 when Nico Rosberg smoke bombed out of that very very suddenly and, and Mercedes found themselves scrambling for a driver wh wh who was Valtteri Bottas um, to be put next to Lewis Hamilton for that following season um, because everybody's in contracts everybody has a contract and they're signed sealed delivered and it takes a lot to be able to negotiate or you know takes a lot of money to be able to break th those contracts so um, I personally don't think Bottas would be asked back. Um, I I would imagine they would go for somebody different, potentially even an Esteban Ocon, um, who would, he's currently with Alpine, but he is a Mercedes driver. Um, potentially move him there. And then someone like Oscar Piastri, who is without a seat. Uh, he's the current Formula 2 world, cha uh, world champion. Um, he would be moved into that Alpine okay. seat because he is an Alpine driver. So I think for me, that would be the most logical. I I think Bottas had his time at Mercedes. I mean, he's a great stopgap. He's a great seat warmer, as we've seen. Um, so whether or not that is the, that is, that would be happening again, I would just be very surprised if that was there, if that was Mercedes choice. Okay. Hey, one last point on 
Hamilton then. So he's 37 years of age. I'm just going to throw a bunch of facts and figures at the listeners. I'm sure you're au fait with all this already. So he's on seven world titles alongside Schumacher. He has the most pole positions in history. He's won the most races, 103 races won. And his winning rate, his percentage rate is 36%. So Schumacher's winning record was 30%. And the all-time record is Juan Manuel Fangio at 47%. But he raced in a third fewer races than Hamilton. So Hamilton's record here is absolutely astonishing. Uh, Schumacher retired at 37, did return, raced till he was 43. He was the oldest to achieve a podium. Uh, uh, Kimi Raikkonen won the US Grand Prix at 39 but like Prost retired at 38, Lada 35, on it goes. Uh, this is a young man's sport. In Hamilton, this is the question I want to ask because I'm, I'm coming to this uh, probably via Drive to Survive a little bit. Uh, Hamilton at 37, this past season, like you are ageing, your nerve must change as you get older, that feels inevitable. Uh, certainly Verstappen was the aggressor of the two on the track right across the season. And uh, how many times did we see Hamilton give way or, or, or pull out of a potential uh, clash. Would you say Hamilton at 37 is less aggressive than he was five, six, seven, eight years ago? Are you starting to see Hamilton go into some kind of very natural decline, very understandable decline? Or where is his racing for you, Jess? See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare to call it a decline. I don't think we've seen Lewis Hamilton decline yet. Um, I would definitely agree he's less aggressive, but I think you find that with most... Uh, rookies that then become the seasoned uh, champions uh, a lot of the time. Vettel had the exact same thing. Vettel was called the Torpedo Kid uh, when he first joined Formula One. He caused a lot of accidents and then went on to become a very young world champion. And, you know, now you can't even believe it when you see it. Um, when he, when he's racing now, that that, that that used to be his reputation. Lewis Hamilton had the exact same reputation, maybe not, not so much Torpedo Kid, but he made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and was super aggressive. And I think what you what they learn as they go through their time in Formula One is actually it's a marathon, not a sprint. And world champions uh, are made on consistency, not just out and out skill or having the best car. It's about who finishes the most amount of races and takes home the most points. Mm. And I think that is a that's a maturity thing rather than a, a loss of nerve guess, or something. A, a loss of nerve. Yeah, I don't think I think you know we saw that. that after a while, Hamilton gave as good as he got almost when it came to the Max Verstappen. Hence the uh, couple of times we saw them coming together and, you know, Saudi Arabia, they both had elbows out. Um, and I think that's that's just more to do with Lewis's style and more to do with the fact with Max's style. Max's style is out and out aggressive. Mm. Um, I mean, absolute spellbinding to watch, but he is very aggressive. So I don't think it's a decline. And I think, you know, I mean, he is his own hype train, but Hamilton always talks about how he's never been fitter he's never been faster he's never been you know better than he is at this point in time and i think a lot of that is true um that mm. you know they they he is he he is incredibly athletic you know they're always posting online about their training regimes and and how fit they are i mean naturally i think you do see the peak and the crest but i just don't feel like we've seen it with lewis yet he's still putting in absolutely spellbinding performances mm. that don't make you think that, ah, oh, you know, with, with with Schumacher, when he returned, it was very much almost like, it was almost sad to watch. He just didn't have it anymore. Mm. It, it wasn't there. I mean, it, you have to also, uh, I guess, bear in mind that he came into a completely different era of Formula One again. Um, it wasn't like he had progressed with it. He took a hiatus and it came back and they were completely different machines. So I think, you know, that you have to take into account rather than just saying he lost his skill. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we, we've had, we've got a lot of, you know, older drivers. Fernando Alonso has returned and I get, I know he's not in a, a potential race winning car, but he was on the podium last year. So again, like we've got these old boys, but they show no sign of letting up or that their skills waning. I think a, a, the, the great drivers keep it for a very, very long time. Okay, really interesting. Jess McFadden, thanks so much. Much appreciated, Jess. Thanks, thanks so much. Off the ball on News Talk.